please start coming in towards the end of September through December. So keep a lookout for those emails and I'll always try to them updated scholarship lists. They will also be posted on Schoology and please feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions. I'm gonna be managing the chat because we have the wonderful Marion Hargrave here to present for us tonight. She has been doing this with me for years and we're very grateful and appreciative for her. So I'm gonna turn it over to her. If you have any questions, you can ask them in the panel that's on the right-hand side of your screen or feel free to email me after the presentation and I hope you enjoy. So thank you, Marion, on to you. Thanks, Tara. Appreciate it. Just let me know if anything sounds goofy. Okay. <laughs> All right. So welcome everyone. Thanks for having me uh, in your homes tonight. I appreciate you joining us and um, not sure what we're all having for dinner, but I'm sure it's pretty good. It's a nice night and um, I hope you're enjoying the weather and also staying well. And we're hopefully started off to a much better uh, school year. So, um, Let's get started. I'm going to share my screen. There we go. <clears throat> and um, let's talk about something fun like financial aid. Oh boy, why is this not advancing? So thanks for your patience. Um, my name is Marion Hargrave, as uh, Tara said, and this is my contact information. You are welcome to get a hold of me if you have questions along the way or immediately after tonight. I'm happy to help you. Um, just a, a couple of things I want to mention about the content of the program. This information is most urgently needed uh, by seniors and senior parents. Uh, but if you happen to be uh, another class level, juniors, sophomores, even, even. Um, the information will be helpful for you as well. But I do uh, caution you that there are changes every year in financial aid. So don't assume that what you hear this year would be relevant for your student who might be a junior or sophomore in the subsequent years. Uh, it's important to check in often and make sure you have the most accurate information. And that's what we strive to provide to you. Um, there will be major financial aid changes um, in the next couple of years, so do do pay attention to that. Um, throughout the presentation tonight, just in general, as a principal, I hope you will keep in mind ROI, return on investment. This is um, the case for students and parents. Uh, it's really important to um, make sure that this very costly investment called higher education is going to pay off uh, for your student. Students, what you really need to think about is your major choice, uh, the academic demands of it, are they realistic? Do you know what your expected salary will be? Uh, because if you don't know what your salary will be, you really don't know what you should spend to make that salary. Um, also, what's the supply and demand for your career choice? Um, Today, tomorrow, when when are the demands really uh, best for you to be employed? And then what are your employment options? These are kinds of questions that students don't necessarily think of uh, when they think of financial aid per se, but knowing the answer to each one of these things really may mean that your student will spend less because they make good choices. Parents for you, just consider college costs. Um, there's certainly more than what you see there, tuition, housing, et cetera. Um, and living expenses need to be um, taken into consideration, not just for the first year, but beyond that first year. Uh, consider that if your student is attending a four-year school, hopefully they will actually graduate in four years because that is the first way to save money, uh, or a two-year school, or even a business trade or technical school. Um, consider the cost beyond that first semester or, or year. Um, and also parents, I encourage you to consider now the option, whoopsie, I consider you to, um, I would hope you would consider, you know, your commitment to um, providing loans for your students. So having posed those questions to both students and parents, let me give you some tools that will help you to get answers. One of those might be mysmartborrowing.org. 
which is an interactive uh, website that FIA has created, free to use and really an excellent way to get real numbers about career salaries and career salaries in different states um, because you know the cost of living is very different even within Pennsylvania. Uh, this website makes a distinction between Western PA and Eastern PA, which is very different uh, economically. Um, so I encourage you to check out my smart borrowing. And at the federal level, federalstudentaid.gov is really your go-to site uh, for really both students and parents for everything related to uh, federal financial aid. A lot of good insight in there, um, and that, that does include federal loans. So right now, it, wherever you are, either as a junior or senior, I would encourage all of you not to underestimate um, the value of schools' ability to change costs um, because most families do not pay, um, you know, the full price for the cost of their education. Um, you can determine what your net price for any institution would be um, either through the government's website, which is collegecost.gov, that'll get you there, or through the post-secondary schools' websites. Every one of them is required, if they offer federal financial aid, uh, to have a net price calculator. So some of these are more sophisticated than others, um, but I encourage you to start with that. The net price calculator, again, will help you to see that maybe what you think is an expensive school may end up being affordable uh, for your family. So just some basic principles of federal aid. Um, it is expected that both the student and the parent to whatever extent possible, uh, take some responsibility in paying for it. Um, keep in mind that need-based aid, which is based on income and assets, et cetera, that's a, subject to a federal formula. And so not all families will actually qualify for that type of aid. Uh, so up front, you need to understand that. Now, there are two types of uh, aid. One is gift aid, which is based on financial need. Um, and that financial need, again, is uh, determined by your assets, your income, family size, or merit, which would be the student's ability, their actions, uh, different criteria that schools have to offer gift aid. Scholarships and grants are considered gift aid, and those are free funds. Um, and gift aid can come from the federal government, the state, certainly comes from FIA, the schools and colleges themselves, and then also outside organizations. Um, so gift aid is one place to start. And then secondly would be self-help types of aid. That would be loans, work study, uh, tuition reimbursement programs, um, U.S. military benefits. So self-help aid obviously means that the student and or uh, their parent is doing something in order to achieve that financial aid. So to make financial aid, then the process of achieving it and applying for it simple, um, just take a look at these five steps. Uh, very simply put, this is what it amounts to. Um, first, look for free money, know your deadlines, Complete the free application for federal student aid. Compare schools financial aid offers carefully. And then in the end, as simple as it sounds, is just make sure you have the money that you need. Um, and that's based on the decision a student and the family makes about school choice. So let's just take a look at free money first. Um, if a student was diligent in looking for scholarships, that effort really will pay off. Uh, scholarships are available beyond the first year. There's a wide variety of uh, criteria for scholarships. So I always remind students, they do not have to be perfect uh, students in order to achieve a scholarship. And the bottom line is that scholarships will reduce the student's debt and parents probably your debt because the need to borrow will lessen. Uh, scholarships will come in and fill those gaps. So definitely worth working for. Um, and again, can make the gotta have school the first or the gotta have first uh, school of choice possible. And I also also like to remind students that um, achieving a scholarship, at least applying for a number of scholarships in the process of that 
really demonstrates their ambition, their determination. Um, so ownership in their future, those are all great traits also to succeed in education. And I would say uh, in their careers and in life. So um, that's the real value of scholarships. Now, the second step is to know your deadlines. Of course, students tend to understand deadlines for admission. Uh, hopefully, your students are achieving or pursuing scholarships and they're aware of their deadlines. Um, but the biggie here in terms of financial aid is that the FAFSA, the free application for federal student aid, which I would encourage 99.9% .9 of families to complete, that becomes available this October of the senior year. So just in a few weeks, right? But what is the deadline for completing the FAFSA? So for senior students completing the FAFSA, your deadline is based on the schools that you're looking at. Each school has a priority deadline for the FAFSA. The schools will accept the application after their deadline, but students, if you achieve that deadline and, and complete the FAFSA um, by those deadlines, you're actually setting yourself up to have the best opportunity for the best financial aid at those schools. So again, will they take the FAFSA afterwards? Absolutely, but you certainly wanna have it in uh, if you can meet those deadlines, it's to your advantage. Also in terms of deadlines, the Pennsylvania State Grant has deadlines. May 1 or August 1, depending on the type of school that the student is looking at. And what I would say to you families is regardless of what currently is your student's idea of a school choice, I would encourage everyone to get the application in by May 1st. We're gonna talk about the Pennsylvania State Grant uh, application. It's very simple and straightforward, and it really is aligned with the FAFSA. Um, so when you complete the FAFSA, you can complete the FIA application for the state grant form. State grant, sorry. So just to remind, the FAFSA is important because, and it is step three in this process, because it um, is what connects your student to federal aid, uh, such as the Pell Grant and school-based federal programs, work study, which is where a student works on their campus uh, and uses that money uh, to either pay off their school debt or even for living expenses. The FAFSA also gets your student in touch with the Pennsylvania State Grant because the FAFSA is a requirement uh, for receiving the state grant and other eligibility requirements. And then also the FAFSA connects the student to school programs. Now, you can access the FAFSA at studentaid.gov. You can still access it through fafsa.gov, right, that URL. Um, or there are the mobile app, um, th there is the mobile app for the FAFSA. Uh, so any one of these vehicles is one way to start and complete the FAFSA uh, for both the student and the parent. And we're going to talk about that application process in detail in just a bit. Just keep in mind that when you are completing the FAFSA, it does matter what browser you use. Either Firefox, Chrome, or Safari are preferred. If you do not use a preferred browser, chances are your pages are not going to load properly. They may not save properly. So this is something to note. Make sure that you're using an up-to-date browser. So, this is the information for the FAFSA that students and or parents may need. I say students and or parents um, because some of this does not apply to one or the other, or it may apply to both. And I say may need because you simply may not have a circumstance where this information is required. So, it's helpful to have this information in front of you when you begin the FAFSA, but keep in mind that the FAFSA does not need to be started and stopped all in one sitting. So if you find that you have three out of the five things that you need, you can save the application, stop it, go get the documents that you need either that day or the next day and go back to the FAFSA. It's fluid that way. Um, it's also fluid for other reasons, to make corrections, to add school choices, et cetera. So um, just keep in mind that generally this is the information that's most important. Um, tax returns for 
two years prior to the application year. So that would be for 2019, if you happen to be a senior or a senior family. Uh, W-2s, et cetera, from 2019. Uh, checking and savings balances as of the date the FAFSA is submitted. Uh, business records, et cetera. Untaxed income records, et cetera. And um, let me tell you that the FAFSA application does an excellent job of helping you through the questions. So if any of these documents seem confusing to you or you're not sure if you have them or what you would need, um, there are little question mark icons throughout the FAFSA and I encourage you to use them because you'll see more detail about each of the questions and each of the documents that's being required. Now, so far I have been referencing that parents are involved in this process. And that is because unless your student meets any of these conditions that you see on the screen, um, they're considered dependent for financial aid purposes. There's a joke there about, yes, they are dependent, but I'm not gonna do it. Uh, I'll just mention that. Um, if your student is any of these conditions, they are automatically independent, right? But some students do fall into a gray area where they're not automatically independent, but they may have a situation um, where they cannot provide parental information. There are a series of questions on the FAFSA that the student will be asked um, to help them get to um, the decision of whether they need parental information or not, right? So I'm giving you the definition here of who supplies the information on the FAFSA, but keep in mind, within the FAFSA application, that information is also contained. So, along with the student, married parents who are living together will also help the student complete the FAFSA, meaning one of those parents will provide the reported information, but the reported information will be from both of those parents living together in that home with the student. Now, Biological parents who happen to not be married, but are also living together with the student will also provide information on the FAFSA. So my joke is that one of you two parents will have to draw the short straw and help your student through the application. Now, if the student is coming from a divorce or separated home, this is the rule. The parent that the student lived with the most in the preceding 12 months is considered the custodial parent and therefore the parent who completes the information on the FAFSA. Now, there are situations, although I don't think it's as common as you might think, but where families will say, well, it is absolutely equal. The student is with each of us equally down the middle. Well, then what you need to defer to is which parent provides more monetary support throughout the year, right? So not so much who is the custodial parent, but who is the more supportive parent in terms of monetary amounts, right? Step parents are also involved. If the step parent is uh, part of the household with the student, their information goes on the FAFSA as well. And adoptive parents are treated simply like, of course, biological parents. But again, on the right side of your screen, you see that foster parents, legal guardians, who are legal guardians by court order, do not provide information on the FAFSA, nor does anybody else that the student might be living with. And um, those questions that I mentioned earlier really get to the heart of whether or not the student needs to provide information and by whom. Sometimes, in some cases, the student who's not independent still simply completes the FAFSA with their own information. And in that case, they work with their school choice um, to sort of mitigate why is it that you couldn't provide parental information. Just to give you some example as to why um, students might not be able to provide parental information, although they're not automatically independent, would be incarcerated parents, parents whose whereabouts are unknown, parents who are suffering mental or uh, physical trauma and simply don't have the wherewithal uh, to help the student. Those are some of those conditions. 
And all of those need to really be discussed with the student's school choice once the FAFSA is submitted. So in order to begin the FAFSA, um, what I would recommend, especially in fact only to senior families tonight, is that you go ahead and create your FSA ID accounts. That stands for Federal Student Aid ID accounts, right? Those uh, accounts are created one by the student who is applying uh, on the FAFSA and one by the parent who will be reporting the FAFSA information. Now, having said that, if both parents are involved, right, um, and completing the FAFSA information with the student, each parent can create an FSA ID, but only one parent will be signing off on the FAFSA ultimately. So really what I would recommend is that you do complete the FSA IDs now. So you have them in advance of starting the FAFSA anytime after October 1, senior families. And also um, that parents, if you are uh, living together with the student, you determine which, which one of us is gonna be the reporting parent and try and stay consistent with that. You'll be referred to as parent one or parent two. Uh, try and make a note of which one of us did we say was parent one or parent two um, and write that down and keep it and also keep all of this S FSA ID information secure. Write down, this is my student's account, this is my account, uh, and any information that you use like your password and email addresses to create that. The FSA ID is pretty important. Now. Also within the FAFSA, keep in mind that you are going to come across something called the IRS data retrieval tool. And this is an opportunity, or I should say uh, a component of the FAFSA that allows you the opportunity to import your tax information from 2019, if you're a senior family, uh, directly from the IRS. That means that you do not have to go through as many records um, to go ahead and manually apply your um, income, uh, et cetera, uh, taxes paid information, et cetera. It'll come right from the IRS. This is actually your friend. It makes life easy. The schools ultimately that, or the school that your student ultimately attends will love you for using the data retrieval tool because it makes their jobs easier. They don't have to corroborate as much of your information because it's coming right from the IRS. Now, there are some exceptions to using the data retrieval tool, and the only consequence of those exceptions would be that you will need to complete the questions manually instead. And your eligibility to use the data retrieval tool may change from year to year, right? So for example, if you had an amended return, that may be a reason that you can't use the data retrieval tool. If your marital status changed, uh, between 2019 and now, it may make the DRT uh, unavailable to you. But down the road, those situations will be rectified. Uh, so keep that in mind. Within the FAFSA also, a student will be listing their school choices. And these are simply, I should say, really school options. This is a list of 10 schools that they're considering. They do not have to have applied to the schools yet. They don't have to be accepted yet. They're just listing their school options. And what that means is that this list of schools that they submit are the schools that will actually access the FAFSA information from the family. And that enables those schools to then begin to create some sort of picture of what kind of financial aid the student might receive. All right, so that's the purpose of adding the schools. And although at any one time, a maximum of 10 schools can be listed, Schools can be deleted afterwards and then added, uh, other schools can be added. Uh, just a couple notes on the FAFSA. Uh, we recommend that your student says yes, they are interested in a work study job. This does not obligate them to anything, but it does put them in a pool to be considered for work study, which is a competitive program where your student would get paid at least minimum wage oftentimes more um, in between their classes, hopefully in a job that has something to do with their major, but not necessarily. Um, 
but work study has always been a really positive program. So we encourage work study and also another value of work study is that work study funds do not count against your student on their subsequent FAFSA. Right? Also, we recommend that your student says yes, they're interested in federal student loans. Again, that is purely to get information that they can consider about that option. There is no obligation. Um, I think that slides a bit out of order, so I'm going to skip that. Now, also within the FAFSA, once you submit it, once you're ready to submit, and you receive a, a confirmation page on that confirmation page will be the Pennsylvania state grant application link. Right? So it will say, click here to complete your state's state grant application. So hopefully you'll keep in, keep that in mind. It's on the confirmation page. However, it's easy to miss. And so you'll see on the left hand side of the screen. If you miss it, the alternative is to simply go to FIA.org and complete the form that way. You do have to wait until the FAFSA is processed if you go that route at FIA.org um, because it takes a couple of days for the federal government to notify FIA that your student's application is available. Um, and in between, oftentimes you will receive at that point a reminder from FIA if you miss that link that, hey, you're eligible to complete the Pennsylvania state grant form. Here's how to do it. Go to this link. The state grant form um, really is very straightforward. Um, and um, there's just a few questions that are not available on the FAFSA that uh, we need to address. And so that's the purpose really of the state grant form. It only parents, students keep this in mind. It only needs to be completed once, right? So uh, current seniors, when you complete the FAFSA and you complete the state grant form, that's the last time you'll ever have to complete the state grant form unless you get married or have a dependent as that changes your status. Um, but you do have to renew the FAFSA every year. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Now, other forms that may need to be completed aside from the FAFSA would be something called the College Scholarship Service Profile or CSS Profile, and possibly uh, a specific form by a college or colleges that you are considering um, that is unique to that school itself. If you don't know if schools that you're looking at require these forms, uh, I highly encourage you to look into that. This is a list of schools in Pennsylvania um, it's actually more up to date than that would show, but this is an accurate list of schools in Pennsylvania that do require the CSS profile. And the CSS profile is a product of the college board. There are costs associated with it, but if you're looking and these are only Pennsylvania schools, by the way, the profile is used nationwide by hundreds of schools. Um, and if your student is looking at a school that requires the, the CSS profile, you do have to complete it. It's a requirement in order to uh, receive financial aid from that school. And also keep in mind that the profile is not a substitute for the FAFSA. It's actually an additional form. And the profile also needs to be renewed just like the FAFSA. So for more information on the profile, uh, I would encourage you to see your specific schools choices that are requiring it and also to take a look at more information at uh, the collegeboard.org. Now, after filing the FAFSA, this is what happens. Your information will be shared with FIA and all the college choices that are indicated at that point, and then down the road if others are added. Uh, the student will receive a message about their student aid report, or uh, what we call a SAR, which is a summary of all the information on the FAFSA. And also at that point with that notification and any notification from FIA and the colleges, really encourage your student to monitor their email accounts uh, and stay ahead of those. Um, only put on the FAFSA an email address that um, for the student in particular and also for parents uh, that you check frequently, that's reliable. Um, 
parents, I've been asked, can I just put my email account uh, or address, I'm sorry, in where my student would put an email address? Yes, you can. You can do that on the FAFSA. You cannot do that when you create the FSA IDs, right? So um, I also would remind that students should not put their high school address on the FAFSA or on their FSA ID because that um, address will be removed once they've graduated. Now, the other thing that occurs after the FAFSA is submitted is that the expected family contribution is calculated. And that again is through a federal formula. Um, it considers your income, your assets and other factors, both from the parent and the students. Um, it's pretty much in, you know, it's in theory, it's what you could reasonably be expected to pay for college expenses. But having said that, um, there are very few people that I know of who have been reasonably able uh, to pay college expenses uh, in the amount of their expected family contribution. And that's understood. That's that's how the formula works. So consider the expected family contribution as a benchmark. It's a way to show how needy your student actually is. And that needy could neediness could go from very needy, meaning no family resources, to uh, somewhere in the middle, to not qualifying at all for need-based aid. But keep in mind, again, the EFC is not necessarily what you pay. So a couple of things about the EFC, which are important. Once the EFC is calculated by the federal government, it remains the same no matter what school a student attends, because it is a number that dictates more or less what type of federal aid a student should receive. Right, and that will be the same at any school. Now, um, you know, what will change are school costs, but not the EFC. And the EFC is primarily income driven, right? And for dependent students, as I suspect most of your families are tonight, uh, or usually are, um, the parental and student income and assets are most influential. The family size and the number of family members in college at the same time is also influential. And the age of the older parent is also influential, right? Those are the major factors to determine the EFC. Just a little bit further about what you're placing on the FAFSA. Again, you're placing prior prior year income. Marion, I think we lost you. Okay. Hey, Tara. Yeah, I think we lost you a second. <laughs> I, I know that you did, and I apologize, everyone. Um, it's really important when you plug in your laptop that both ends are connected. It's just it's it seems simple, but it's it matters. So it I, I apologize. I'm I'm glad to be back. So I'm glad we can resume right here too. Parents, the income um, that you're putting on the FAFSA will be from the two years prior to when your student is applying. If you're a senior. <laughs> Thank you comment. Um, if you're a senior, that's from 2019. Um, and also consider that uh, you're, you're reporting assets as well. And this does not have to really get um, uh, into the weeds all that much. Consider this assets are not the value of a primary residence, personal property, 
qualified retirement accounts like 401ks, uh, 403bs, life insurance policies, those are not reported on the FAFSA, right? So what, what remains then would be, if this is your scenario, uh, would be any additional real estate that you have. You have to place a market value on that. Um, any additional stocks, bonds, mutual funds that are not considered qualified retirement accounts. Um, that's what you're reporting on the FAFSA. You're also reporting uh, as an asset um, tuition account program values. So consider those are PA 529s. They might not actually even be from Pennsylvania. That doesn't matter, but you do report um, 529 or TAP funds on the FAFSA under uh, parent assets. Now, a parent asset between a parent assets and a student asset, parent assets are actually better because there's a protection allowance that is applied for parents and it's based on your age. So very simply put, the closer you are to retirement or the older you are, the more heavily protected your assets are, which means a lesser percentage of those asset assets are going to matter uh, for your students' financial aid uh, eligibility, right? So I think we got that covered. That's usually a sticking point, but let's not let it be. Uh, and somehow I'm not moving now. So for students, allowances are also made. Uh, as I mentioned, work study uh, funds are excluded. Um, a student has uh, this year, it's to, to be determined, but has at least $6,600 that they could have earned before any of that is going to affect their aid eligibility. Anything over that amount, just 50% is actually assessed. Uh, for their contribution of the expected family contribution. Um, but also any student who really owns assets must report those. And student assets do not have a protection allowance. So that's why I say that parent assets are certainly better. Don't be afraid of reporting your assets because uh, better that they be in a parent name versus a student. Because right off the bat, a student's assets are heavily utilized in the formula. And the formula is called a need analysis, and it's what um, is on the student's student aid report, the SAR. And when schools receive the SAR and the FAFSA, they take a look at these two components. What's the cost of education? What was determined by the federal government to be the expected family contribution, um, which again includes both parental contribution and student contribution. And I say that in theory, because a lot of times it means you parents, um, but they take a look at those two components and they begin to package your students' financial aid. Now, in terms of a calendar, this, this part of the process occurs generally after January, even February. Um, and that's sort of the season where schools begin to make financial aid packages. And it also presumes that at that point, uh, your student has applied to the schools that they've listed on the FAFSA and have been accepted to those schools. Otherwise, they will not hear from their schools, right? The school needs to tie that to, well, is the student even admitted? Why should we provide a financial aid award if not, right? So that's hopefully that gives you a few months there where you see how how things are going. So yes, is it important to put the FAFSA in as after um, October first? There is no standard format, so they can be difficult to read. Um, some include federal loans, some do not. Some have some crazy uh, acronyms or abbreviations than other schools, and it makes it very difficult um, to compare apples to apples. But it's worth understanding these notices for sure, 
And so if you don't, you simply have the student call the school and say, I, I don't really understand this. Go buy it line by line. And parents, if you want to be in on that conversation, you can be, but your student really needs to request that kind of clarification. Bottom line is what those notices are going to tell you is what's your out of pocket costs, right? And that's the bottom line. Now, in this process, if things have changed since 2019, and I dare say probably because we've all been through a lot. Um, so if um, divorce has occurred, there's step parents involved, adopted parents, foster parents, um, and the biggie there that I really want to get to is recent death or disability and reduced income. Uh, if uh, you have your family, the student's family has experienced um, any of these circumstances. You can't really change what you had to place on the FAFSA. So this is to say in 2019, maybe parents, you had a really excellent income year and that has changed since then. Well, you do have to report 2019, but what you do then is talk with the schools that your student is looking at and discuss how your income has been reduced, uh, how a death or a disability has affected um, the family income. They will ask for documentation and they will take into consideration those changes, but it's not that you complete a FAFSA differently. You simply work with, work with the schools. Um, you know, to talk about the circumstances and they're going to want documentation. And then this is the point where it seems ultra, ultra simple, but this is the truth. At that point, when you're looking at those award notices, you're thinking about what your student is going to pursue career wise or academically, how strong they are in certain areas, et cetera. Take all of that information and look at it from a return on investment standpoint. Do you have does your student have a pretty good shot of getting a return on investment? Now that you see what a school will cost and now what you understand to be your out of pocket costs. And at that point, just figure out what's our strategy um, and what are our loan options if you don't have those out of pocket costs. Now, before we go any further, let's just talk about what a school might offer in terms of need based aid. But before I move to that screen, I just want to say that I cannot address what other types of aid a school could provide to your student. So the merit aid, because your kiddo is a heck of a pianist or uh, an athletic scholarship. Um, you know, I, I don't maybe based on your heritage or your religion or your race, your student is going to receive or your students characteristics. Therefore, your student is going to receive some merit based aid. Um, sometimes that's what those net price calculators will get to. And sometimes that's just the conversations that you have to have with the schools. But I guarantee you that 9 times 9.9 .9 times out of 10. Schools are going to want your student to complete the FAFSA. Before they offer any types of other aid. Right? So at the federal level. Pell grant is the grant that is the largest that goes to financially needy students and for the 21 22 academic year that's for you seniors the maximum award amount is six thousand four hundred and ninety five dollars and that is for a student whose expected family contribution is five thousand eight hundred and forty six dollars or less right so that expected family contribution will ultimately be on the student aid report. That's where you'll see it. You will see it on a confirmation page sometimes when the FAFSA is completed. And the reason on this screen that you don't see a dollar sign or a comma within that EFC amount is because that's how you'll see the figure um, on the federal uh, FAFSA information, right? So to get you sort of acclimated to that, um, that's that's how it's shown, um, and that is because the we don't want to perpetuate the idea that the EFC is actually the amount that you will pay to a school. Um, you know, it's not a dollar. It's not a dollar until the school gets to take a look at it. 
Campus-based aid is considered a federal program, even though it sounds like it sure isn't. Um, and there's two campus-based aid programs. One is the Federal Supplemental Educational Opportunity Grant. There will not be a test after this, uh, so don't worry. But the FSEOG is up to $4,000 a year. And then federal work study, which is determined by the financial aid office at each school. So that is to say that one school could offer your student $2,000 in federal work study and another school could offer 1,000 and it is simply the way each school determines that amount uh, on their campus for federal aid. A um, couple of things, uh, work study is not guaranteed, it's competitive and work study also is not paid out until your student works. Um, so just consider that. Ask schools as you're visiting or at orientation programs or even sooner, um, you know, what is the process for my child to get a work study job? And students don't be afraid to ask that question as well because uh, they, they make a difference. And again, it's a good program to, to um, sort of navigate, navigate your campus. So the Pennsylvania State Grant Amount uh, Award is currently, yay, uh, the highest amount uh, that it's ever been except for one other time in our state grant history since 1963. Um, for a full-time student who is, a, is a eligible for the maximum award, uh, it's $5,000 per year, right? So that's a Pennsylvania student uh, attending a school that qualifies for the Pennsylvania State Grant. So just to skip that second bullet, if your student is going out of state, the only states where they could receive an award up to $600 per year would be the District of Columbia, which is not a state, uh, Delaware, Massachusetts, Ohio, Vermont, and West Virginia. In those states, um, veterans would receive a maximum award of $800. So, obviously, if your student chooses to go to a school outside of Pennsylvania, which is not one of these portable states, although even these portable states are certainly $600 is drastically reduced amount, um, you know, that is that may have a consequence because you are um, negating the $5,000 that your student uh, may be eligible for. Now, having said that, $5,000 is the maximum award for a student attending a school that is anywhere from $29,000 to $32,000. So on this graph, we're going from the bottom up, right? Because the state grant has cost tiers based on the cost of the institution. So an award could be anywhere from $2,600, let, let me say it the right way, $2,660, uh, all the way up to $5,000, depending on the cost of the school. Uh, these cost tiers sort of represent from the bottom up private institutions, right? Um, state assisted schools, um, and then the um, Pennsylvania state system schools, and then finally, generally, um, community colleges, business trade, technical schools, sometimes that's in that first tier from zero to $12,000 per year. So I hope that helps in understanding that. Now, I am not going to pay a whole lot of time to the programs on these next two slides, but I absolutely wanna draw your attention to them because they are important. Each one of these has its own criteria. Um, they each have uh, different application processes, but these are different types of programs that may provide some additional funding for your student. Just to take a look at a couple of the state work study program, if your student is not eligible for federal work study, then they may be for state work study. So that certainly is um, another option. Um, the uh, National Guard Educational Assistance Grant Program is for uh, Guard members, uh, folks who have made a commitment to the National Guard, and then also dependents um, now can carry that on in some cases. So um, take a look at each of these programs at FIA.org. There are other funding opportunities is what the category is that they're under. Um, this is the rest of these other state programs. The reason why these are affiliated with FIA is because we do the automation work for each of them. 
Um, we uh, do the diligence to ensure eligibility is um, accurate, et cetera. Um, so uh, please take a look at them. Certainly um, worth your while to do so. So that brings us to the four letter word of loan. Because now that you see what your student might receive in terms of federal and state aid, um, and sort of the X or the unknown is what they might receive from any school. And you want to begin to consider, well, how do I fill that gap um, between costs and what I can afford out of pocket? And by no means, parents, am I obligating you to your students' costs? You are not. Um, so students, you should be thinking of these things as well. You know, how are we going to cover it? Um, that brings us to loans. Now, in terms of a calendar, um, the idea or the notion of whether you need loans or not, uh, it's very premature to know that or to know to what extent you do, uh, because you've got to get through that whole process of receiving a student uh, aid package, making a decision about a school, and then having a clear idea what the bottom line is, right? And then you know whether or not federal loans are in your future. Now, these interest rates, I think, are a little bit off. They were just recently changed over the summer here. Um, but just consider that the types of loans that the federal government offers to students um, would be subsidized and unsubsidized. Um, so two different methods. Subsidized means that interest is paid for while your student is in school. Yay, that would be preferable, right? We would want that. And unsubsidized means that your student doesn't demonstrate the need for the funds, um, but they are always eligible to borrow from the federal government. But the government will then say, well, interest is going to accrue on this loan while you are in school. Um, and to be very clear, most students receive federal student loans um, in a combination of subsidized and unsubsidized, right? But we do encourage students to take federal student loans because they have a lot of advantages. Um, they have a lot of knowns. Uh, and to be quite honest, no one else will more than likely allow your dependent student to borrow other than the federal government. So it's a win. There is also a parent loan called a parent loan for undergraduate students. That is available through the federal government. Um, and again, these interest rates are a little bit off. That's actually gone down a little bit this year. Um, and the interest rates for both students and parents changes every year. Just keep that in mind. And you also see that there is a graduate student option as well. Um, real quickly, because again, this is down the road um, and you will be borrowing um, at this point with the help of the student's school choice. But parent loans are relatively easy to get. There's a very lenient credit check. Most parents get a plus loan if they choose one. Now, if you don't choose a plus loan, there are loans called private or alternative education loans. And these simply are built more like any other type of loan. First of all, most dependent students cannot borrow in their own name. They usually need a cosigner. Um, and when you're considering these loans, this might be as a family, you want to decide, well, parents, should I bear, borrow through the plus loan or should I take out an alternative loan? The terms vary by every lender. Um, so you really have to do your due diligence to make sure when you're taking out a private loan that you understand the terms and that you're really making the best choice for a loan. Also consider parents, this is for you. Every year you borrow, that has a consequence for the next year that you plan to borrow, right? So if you've racked up some debt in the first two years, you may not be an attractive third year borrower. And that's gotta be something that you take into consideration. It can be tricky. Now, I just wanna point out very quickly that FIA underwrites a loan called Pennsylvania Forward or PA Forward. It is a private loan, and I would simply encourage you to take a look at it at fia.org. Um, it may be one of those private options that you want to consider. Um, but so far, it has been very favorable for Pennsylvania residents. Um, PA Forward 
um, certainly like any other private loan has um, uh, approval uh, procedures, right? But we don't approve families who would in any way jeopardize their overall financial strength uh, by borrowing through the program. So basically, uh, if you really cannot afford the loan, it'll be evident and we'll take care of that uh, to help you through um, some other options. So in closing, I just wanna mention families, you need to use your resources. Uh, the best would be studentaid.gov. Um, and I wanna remind you uh, of my name and my contact information. Um, you're welcome to give me a call. I have to tell you that I think your students are in very good, and you parents are in very good hands uh, with uh, the counselors there at the high school and particularly Tara. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. So, we, I did have one question from a parent yes. that I could not answer. It was, okay. is a Roth IRA for minors considered a student asset that must be disclosed? Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I can't even fake it. I know the answer to that. I just forget it. So, Tara. Mm hmm can I look that up and do you know the parent? You'll be able to communicate to that parent maybe? Yes, I'll find out there and I'll look back who it was. Yeah, I'll email them. Yep. Or or parent who's asking that question. I'm very sorry. Um, this is my first rodeo this year and I have forgotten a few things. Um, but there is an obvious answer to that. So if the parent wants to email me, I'm fine with that too. Okay. One way or another, I'll get the information to you, Tara. And if we duplicate, fine. Yep. Sure thing. Sounds okay. good. All right. And Thank there was a question about the presentation being recorded. Yes, I will email it out to everyone and we will post it on the website after Marion gets it to me. It usually takes a couple of days. So that's right. That's right. Thank you. Any yeah. other questions? Tara? No, I think I answered them all. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Yeah. What are you doing next week? What are you yeah. doing for the next six weeks? <laughs> I'll come with you. It'll be a road show. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Thank well, you. let me just say you're welcome. And let me just say in closing, thanks everybody for attending and um look forward to helping you out down the road. And Tara, I'll be in touch with you about that outstanding info. Sounds great. Enjoy open house, everyone. Yes. Have a good night.